Well, good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name's Jerry Hutchinson. Um, I'm an independent uh, uh, wound care specialist. Um, and I'm going to be uh, chairing this morning's session uh, for Parafricta, um, which is entitled Effective Prevention of Heal Ulcers by Reducing uh, Friction and Shear. And we're going to be talking about some theory um, and then looking at translating that um, into practice. Um, a quick declaration for you. I am uh, a non-executive director of Parafricta and I have been uh, doing some consulting work with them as well. Now the um, three presentations that we're going to have today will cover this um, spectrum from theory to, uh, to practice uh, with um, three presentations. Uh, Amit's going to come and talk to us about the biomechanical influence um, of static friction and how that impacts uh, the potential for causing tissue damage. Um, we're then going to have that followed by a presentation by uh, Cathy Bree Aslan. And Cathy has got some really interesting data to show us on the, um, the impact in the tissue. She's got some really interesting uh, ultrasound data to show you on the, uh, the impact of, of um, the damage that is caused um, by friction and shear and what the impacts of managing that friction and shear can be uh, using a low friction material. And then the third presentation will be uh, Debbie Gleason, uh, and Debbie's going to be talking to us about how she's been using the product in a five-year program uh, in her hospital um, and show you the data for reducing pressure, uh, heel pressure uh, ulcers caused by friction and shear and uh, how that's impacted cost effectiveness um, in her um, in her uh, practice. Uh, we'll be taking questions at the end of each of the presentations, uh, so um, please have them ready. So uh, without further ado, um, if I can uh, invite Amit up to the, the podium. I, I was tempted to introduce him, but I kind of don't feel that's really very necessary. <laughs> um, he's been up here so many times, and as the organizer of the conference, it feels a bit superfluous to, uh, to introduce him. So uh, Amit, if I can invite you to come up here and uh, tell us about the, the background to um, friction and shear damage um, in here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Well, I'd like to start, as always, with the beginning, and the beginning is the etiology. And it's not that the etiology has changed much since yesterday when I presented it here, but um, I think that it's important to put the technology of friction reduction, and specifically the parafricta technology, in the context of the etiology. And so, why is it important to reduce friction at the interface between the body and the support in order to protect tissues? And I'm saying tissues deliberately, not the skin, but tissues. Because tissue protection spans from protecting the skin to protecting the deepest tissues, those that are in the vicinity of the bones. And what I'd like to um, focus on today is the effect of reducing friction on protecting tissues across that spectrum, from skin to the deepest. As I was saying, we are constantly and continuously deforming the basic living structures in our body, which is our cells. And as we apply our body weight, and it doesn't matter if it's during sitting or during lying in bed, we distort the tissues. And we distort the tissues in a complex manner. We uh, compress them, but we also stretch them, and we also shear them. And within these tissues, there are cells. And the mechanical loads are transferred across the multi-scales, the multi-dimensions, from the macro to the micro, from the tissues to the cells. And cells are distorted, and cell structures are distorted. And when you look at an individual cell, it's quite a complex structure by itself. It's, um, 
mechanically designed, you could say, to support loads, but of course, like any other structure, like any engineering structure, to a certain extent. And if you exceed that tolerance, you may damage the structure of the cell, its uh, scaffold or skeleton, its walls or envelope, much like if you would overload a bridge or um, um, an engine, you would cause damage to that structure. And I was, as I was mentioning, um, over nearly 20 years of um, a career path, I've been looking at different model systems to understand what is it um, about deformation that um, originates from body weight uh, that damages tissues. And as was very nicely phrased in the previous session, the first thing that you need to do is to measure those deformations so that you can do something about them. And uh, a direct approach for measuring deformations in the living human body is to use the wonderful imaging technologies that we now have, primarily MRI. So you can actually demonstrate, visualize, quantify tissue distortions in uh, MRI settings, um, especially in um, weight-bearing um, MRI um, trials like um, what you can do with a seated MRI configuration to which we had access. And then you can actually measure these distortions of deep tissues and then ask the question, okay, in a different living model system, of course, you can't ask the question how much time it will take until I produce damage in that individual here. But in a different model system, for example, an animal model, you can then um, recreate those loads and look at tissue viability, again at the macroscopic scale, at the microscopic scale, and in even more, I would say, modern research tools, such as what tissue engineering can offer us, you can um, basically build, like in a Lego system, a model of a tissue to which you can apply um, loads, controlled loads, at controlled conditions, thermodynamic, biochemical conditions, and look again at the viability of the tissue at the scale of individual cells, or you can look at the individual cells isolated from the tissues and deform them directly using different model systems that we have developed for that. And all of that, all of that together, indicates that even if you don't account for perfusion, so regardless of the ischemic conditions, deformation and distortion by itself can damage cells, much like in the examples that I've mentioned of machinery parts or bridges, cells are structures, and structures can be damaged by deformation. And going back to this example, which I think very, uh, illustrates it very well, that if you deform a living body enough, you will eventually break their skeleton. And you know, this is old knowledge, right? It goes back to that, in the sense that if you deform a cell for long enough, without ha giving the, uh, the person the ability to respond to that load uh, because, for example, of um, neuromuscular impairment or because he's under anesthetics, uh, and, the, and the load just continues and the deformation is sustained, eventually you'll break down the skeleton of the cell and the other structures of the cell will follow and fail and that will interfere with the cell's ability to control uh, phenomena such as transport, homostasis, and will eventually lead to either necrotic or apoptotic uh, deaths, depending on the uh, magnitudes of loads. So we start the discussion by 
um, stating that deformation is the primary cell killer. And it can kill cells directly by damaging the structure, or it can kill cells indirectly by affecting the vasculature and the lymphatics. But it's the deformation, really. So you need to mitigate the deformation. And of course, you, we can't forget about perfusion. Perfusion is important, but uh, if you look at a time scale, impaired perfusion would affect cell viability in a scale of an hour. And deformation, on the other hand, can inflict damage within tens of minutes. You can see that in different surgical procedures. You can see that on spinal boards. There are many examples from real life scenarios that actually prove that. But now we also have the evidence from these laboratory studies that indicate that you need to minimize the deformation. Now, to the real world. Think about a patient who's lying in bed. His body weight pulls the body structures downwards because of gravity, especially if the head of the bed is elevated. So he's tending to slide in bed. And then there is frictional forces that are developing between the skin and whatever that skin touches. It can be the clothing, it can be the, um, the, 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 the mattress, the, any support surface. And of course, it's not a um, movement on just one axis. There can be rotation, etc. So a lot of frictional forces which create shear in the tissue. That is distortion of parallel planes in the, in the tissue structures once against each other. And again, that translates to the level of individual cells. And much like the uh, macroscopic structure of the tissues and the vasculature, which are distorted in shear, the cells themselves are distorted in shear, and hence the um, cascade of damage to the cell skeleton and envelope the plasma membrane of the cell, and eventually the loss of homostasis and viability. Basic physics, elementary physics, actually high school physics, indicates that frictional forces are proportional to what we call the coefficient of friction, which is a physical characteristic of the two interfacing materials. If these are two rough materials with a rough topography or microtopography, they will create high friction much like what happens with your car when the tires of the car are, um, are contacting the, the, the road. Um, and if it's very smooth surfaces, then the coefficient of friction is very low, uh, like what happens on, uh, when there's ice contacting ice, so there is ice that is melting there, so there is a layer of water there, so it's very smooth, and uh, hence the low value of the coefficient of friction, and the frictional forces will be proportional to that coefficient of friction. So what you want to do in order to minimize these exposure to deformations is to minimize the coefficient of friction, really. So how do you do that? First of all, well, you can off offload, have no contact at all, that's ideal. And here is a study that we've published some years ago showing that if you have no contact, that's not a big surprise, I guess, to anyone. If you have no contact, there's no tissue distortion. You're looking at the cross section through the foot, showing the heel bone. This is the calcaneus, the heel bone, and the fat pad, which is enveloping it. You can see the very irregular structure of the bone here and the uh, distortion in that soft tissue, in that fatty soft tissue, as you are creating contact with different surfaces, with the maximal distortion, of course, being generated when the heel just contact a very rigid surface, like, the, um, like a table. Um, and obviously, once there is physical contact, there is distortion, and that distortion will depend on the as I was saying, the coefficient of friction. 
But in terms of um, practicality, if you try to avoid contact, and even if that individual is spontaneously moving, and, uh, or someone is basically moving him to take care of that patient, you may quickly find yourself in a position where the heel is supported by some surface that wasn't supposed to, to support it where you wanted it to be suspended. So this is quite tricky. The other thing is that uh, the individual anatomy is also um, a very dominant factor in determining these tissue distortions. So we don't have the same structure of noses, right? Our noses vary. Our heels also vary. And our heel bones also vary. Some of them are sharper. Some of them are more blunt. So it depends on the vulner vulnerability of the individual. There are also extrinsic factors. For example, if the temperature is high, um, could be the temperature of the environment, or it can be intrinsic if it's just a patient who is fevering, or if there is moisture and wetness in the environment, the surfaces will change their physical properties. The skin, for example, we all know that when we take a bath, right? The skin, for example, will become more wrinkled. So that's a change in topography. That will actually create more friction and elevate those frictional forces. And those frictional forces, whenever there is contact, are transmitted, are transferred from the contact surface internally into the body. And this is a computer simulation that, again, we've published a couple of years ago that demonstrates how these contact forces are transmitted internally into the body and create distortions in the adjacent soft tissues. And this is another uh, paper showing specifically what happens internally in the structure of the soft tissues of the heel. So basically, we took off the heel bone here to just show what's going on at the interaction between the heel bone and the soft tissue, which, which is right here, the red colors, and red is not good. Red is bad, right? So all, these, all, all this red indicates very high tissue distortions that are generated by the forces that are transmitted over here at the surface. So shear deformations that correlate to frictional forces, which in turn correlate to the coefficient of friction, are transferred internally into the soft tissues to the site around the bone, to the bone soft tissue interface, where they maximize, as you can see here. Hence, if you do something about that interaction, if you, by selecting the right materials, minimize that coefficient of friction, you can avoid that deep tissue distortion that may cause the deep tissue injury, which clinicians would describe as heel ulcers. And again, it's all about the topography of the materials. So if this is a standard uh, fabric, and you can see the rough topography in microscopy, of course, this is a much smarter material with controlled topography properties that are designed to minimize friction. And by putting two of these layers together so that they slide against each other, they basically absorb the frictional forces, preventing most of them to be transferred inwards to the body. So I'll wrap up here by summarizing the major points in my talk. The damage originates from exposure to sustained deformations, which compromise cell viability and function. Hence, the objective should be 
to minimize exposure to deformations, not only at the skin, but also deep in the um, inner layers of the um, relevant tissues. The posterior heels in a, in a patient who's lying in bed, being such a place of interest to uh, prioritize in protection. And one of the promising approaches is to use smart textiles, as was mentioned here before. Particularly low friction fabrics that reduce these frictional effects. The bottom line is prevention is the way forward. And that's the message that um, me and others in this conference and in other venues, other venues are promoting. And managing friction is a key component in uh, effective prevention. Thank you uh, for um, listening. And I'll be happy to take one or two questions if we have time. Do we have any questions for Amit? Uh, while you're thinking, Amit, um, clearly you have a patient in a hospital. Many of them are already on pressure relieving mattresses. Um, is it important still to be thinking about friction in those situations? Well, I think it's critically important because there is no one device, and I think that I'm not the only one who said that in the, in the last day at least. There's no one single device or one single technology that uh, provides a holistic solution to the problem of pressure ulcers, particularly given the complexity of this problem. So you really need a package. You really need, someone said yesterday, I think it was Art Stone who said, a toolbox. You need a toolbox. And um, I would say that an essential component, an essential tool in that toolbox would be means um, and interventions that minimize friction because that directly affect tissue distortions and deformations. Yeah. Any other questions for Amit? No. Over, there, over there you have a question. Uh, um, the problem you always have to put somewhere else. Um, is it you can create the risk of Well, I, I absolutely agree that the problem of offloading is that it's not offloading, it's transferring the load to somewhere else, as, as, as you've said. And, and, and sometimes you can't, because you need, for example, to keep a certain position that would be critical in surgery. Uh, and, and there are other practical constraints why you can't do that. So if you can't offload, or if there is a risk that um, offloading would not be sustainable, much like with these heel suspension uh, improvisations, I could say, that are uh, quite common in different medical facilities, and you don't have any control of what happens once the nurse have left the room, um, it's better to come up with more sustainable solutions for minimizing tissue deformations, right? Any other questions for Amit? Looks like he's got the hand up this time. <laughs> okay. okay, doesn't seem to Thanks, Amit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we've heard from Amit there the background to why um, thinking about and managing friction uh, is so important because of the tissue deformation causing um, potential for deep, uh, deep tissue damage. Uh, now we're going to hear from Cathy Bree Aslan. Cathy is an independent wound care specialist and an expert witness. Um, and Cathy uh, has been involved in a, a study which looked using non-invasive technology at what happens actually in the tissue. So I think now we're going to see what Amit has presented to us uh, being translated into something tangible that you can actually see in tissue. So if I can invite you, Cathy, up to come and present your uh, presentation to us. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say I feel very honoured being amongst all these eminent speakers here today. I'm just a mere clinician, so I hope that the information that I'm giving today is of some use. So I've been asked to look at the clinical manifestations of friction-related damage. 
And as we've just heard, really, friction is somewhat of a drag. And it's particularly a drag for our patients because the long-term potential complications of friction and shear injury, of course, can result in tissue damage, which can be ongoing, can be long-lasting, and eventually could have quite some devastating effects. And that can range, that tissue damage, what we see as clinicians, from something as simple as a red, perhaps boggy feeling heel, to some superficial skin loss, might appear superficial, but actually can be extremely, exquisitely painful for our patients. And of course, much deeper tissue injuries. I think the concept, or, or the, the belief has always been, uh, from a clinician perspective, that friction injury is a very superficial injury. But as we've just heard from Amit, actually, it's the deeper tissues that are also being compromised as a result of these shear and friction injuries. I'm fairly confident that most of us at some point have bought that pair of shoes that has been too tight, had nasty old blisters, so we know just how painful these type of injuries can be. And I sometimes wonder why we don't give more credence to uh, the interventions that we have at our fingertips in the ward situation, in the home situation, to prevent what appear to be very superficial injuries on things like heels and bottoms, because our patients may not be able to move off of them themselves. And I can't even begin to imagine what it must feel like lying in a bed, not being able to move with an injury like this. So as clinicians, what we need to try and achieve is to ensure that our patients have comfort, to ensure that we maintain the skin integrity and wherever possible to prevent harm to the tissues. And we can do that by ensuring that we get good positioning in the first instance. If we can ensure that our patients are nice and comfortable to start with, they're very much more likely to not need to wriggle around in the bed, to shift around, and then to perhaps cause some tissue damage through friction and shear. We need to ensure careful repositioning so ensure that we um, use the equipment that's our, that we have at our disposal to carefully reposition and to prevent injury to the skin. And we can employ the use of specialist equipment and in particular things such as the low friction material equipment. We can use, uh, use beds that profile. We can use slide sheets to help reduce friction as we move our patients in the bed and between the bed and the trolley. And we can use specific pieces of equipment such as the undergarments and the booties made of the low friction material. I haven't put a picture up here, but also of course the dressings is another intervention that people are finding very useful to reduce these type of injuries now. It's important though that if we are using these pieces of equipment that we use them properly. So, for example, with the profiling beds, to ensure that we raise the knee break first so that when we raise the head of the bed, the patient doesn't go sliding down the bed, all those friction forces and shear forces against the bottom and against the heels. If we're using slide sheets to make sure that they're the correct size for the patient so that the whole body is being protected and not just one area. To ensure things such as correct seating, if we plonk our lovely cushions, our pressure-reducing cushions on top of a chair, the patient may feel very unstable in that chair and they will wriggle around and move themselves into a more comfortable and stable position. So if we get the positioning right in the first place, we're less likely to induce these injuries. And ensuring that the patient is comfortable before we walk away from them. We also need to ensure that we're checking back on our patients on a regular basis. And a lot of places now are employing things such as the comfort rounds and the skin bundles. But once again, it's using those to their best effect. One of the things that I see, because I do a lot of review of, of clinical notes and clinical records, is that with the skin bundles and with the repositioning charts and the comfort rounds, we're seeing the same position for the patient at every single round. So the staff may be filling these in every two hours, but they're not actually necessarily using the information that's on that chart to inform what they're going to do next. 
So the patient is always sitting, 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 sitting at every two hour interval that the nurse is going to them, but they're not changing their position. It's always helpful if we can understand our patient's conditions and how that might impact on things such as shear and friction. So for example, the patient with, part with severe Parkinson's disease, with tremors, where we've got constant friction going on between the surface and the skin. Brain injuries, where the patient may have higher ag agitation levels. Dementia or stroke patients that may have repetitive movements such as uh, Jacksonian seizures. The spinal injured patients who are self-transferring, are they catching when they transfer between the bed and the wheelchair? Are they catching on the wheel of the wheelchair? Are they using slide boards? Are they utilizing those slide boards appropriately? Or are they causing friction as they do so? And one of the things as nurses I find we're very good at is ignoring the mobile patient. So the mobile patient who's self-caring, we've done our risk assessment, they're not at particular risk of pressure injury, we let them get on with it. But these mobile patients are just as much, sometimes even more at risk of friction injury because nobody is checking. The patient that pushes themselves up the bed to make themselves more comfortable, digging in that heel, causing friction and shear forces. So just because a patient is mobile, just because a patient is independent, just because a patient is going out and washing themselves and dressing themselves independent, independently, we still need to go back as clinicians and ensure that we check their skin regularly. The European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel and the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel guidelines, of course, tell us that we should be considering the contribution that shear and friction forces have in the development of pressure ulceration. And they also recommend that we consider the use of silk-like fabrics rather than cotton and polycotton fabrics to reduce the shear and friction damage. So the parafrictor material, as we've just seen from Amit's um, presentation, is designed to reduce friction and shear stress associated with patient movement. It has this very low friction coefficient of about 2 point, uh, sorry, 0 0.2, which in comparison to other materials, typically range from between 0.3 and 0.7. And it also reduce, reduces this concept of stiction. And stiction is the additional force that is required to overcome skin sticking to surface before the sliding. Some years ago, and it was some years ago now, it was 2008, 2009, my colleagues and myself took um, a very small sample of patients in, resident, in residential homes and nursing homes, and we looked at whether or not this low friction material could be a useful tool for staff, uh, and cost-effective tool for staff in these care homes to use to help to reduce shear and friction injury in their patients. Now, we did look at the undergarments as well, but I want to focus particularly on the heels. And what we did was we found residents who had redness to their heels, who had bogginess to their heels, and we wanted ones that had this problem with both of their heels so that we could use them as their own control. So we, I think we identified 18 patients, and we gave each of them the low friction material booty for the right foot, but we left the other foot exposed so that we could do a comparison between the two. They did have standard treatment, they all had their um, alternating mattresses, they had their profiling bed frames, and they were all on appropriate repositioning regimes. We also employed the use of um, high frequency ultrasound scanning. Now, with this we can see in the normal skin, we have the epidermis at the top here, underlying with the dermis, and then the subdermal tissues. And you can see from that that the pixels are quite regularly ordered, they're quite close together, and the area shows up as blue. In the edematous tissues, we can see that the pixels are very much further apart, they've migrated, and it's shown up by this reddened area. 
Now, what we found was when we used the parafrictor booty on the right heel, over a period of four weeks, we saw an improvement in the edema in the tissues. So we went from this very wide distribution of pixels and reddening on the scans to a migration of the pixels back toward the normal level. And when we compare the control heel that didn't have the booty, we can see over the four-week period that actually there was very little difference in the uh, edema levels within the tissue. But in the treated heel, the pixels came back together, the reddening reduced, and, manif and that manifested on the surface as a much more healthy-looking heel. We translated that information into these graphs. The dark blue line is the healthy tissue. And in the control heel, we can see over the four-week period, from the pink, which was at time zero, through to the yellow at two weeks and the turquoise at blue, that there was very little change in the distribution of the pixels on the scans. However, in the heel that had the booty, we can see that those distribution lines change. And by week four, the turquoise line is almost back to the normal, healthy, dark blue line. So from that, we summarize that actually, use of these low friction booties could help us to reverse the effects of shear and friction. They could leave the tissues, therefore, less vulnerable to the effects of shearing and help to reduce the risk of an evolution toward ulceration. So in summary, I feel that with the right interventions, as nurses, we should be able to avoid a lot of these friction and shear injuries through good positioning, through careful repositioning, and through the use of specialist equipment. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. Are there any questions for Cathy? Um, I, I'm rather interested in this thing you were saying, Cathy, about the mobile patient being um, at risk, and it, it almost feels a little counterintuitive in a sense. Um, so it seems, if we extrapolate what you're saying, that even mobile patients who maybe don't fit the normal risk assessment pattern would be the patients you would want to have some concern about for friction injury as well. Yes, I think so. I think what we often do, as I said, is we do our risk assessment. We find that our patient is at risk. If they're independent, if they're able to take themselves out to the toilet, we tend to let them get on with it. We want to encourage patients to be self-caring, so it's an ideal opportunity. And we actually, we've got enough other work to do. We've got enough other patients to look after to not worry about it. But as I said, you've got the patients that push themselves up the bed, so they'll dig their heels in, they'll push back, they'll wriggle around, they'll make themselves comfortable in the chair. Bed heights, do we always ensure that the bed height is correct for our patient? If they're getting themselves on and off the bed, are they sliding to do so, or are they able to get themselves up um, properly without any friction and shear forces occurring? So yeah, I think it's a real important thing. And in my line of work, I often see patients that have perhaps been in hospital for short periods of time, but nobody's checked their skin because they've been mobile. And on the day they go home, we find injury. Mm. Are there any other questions for Cathy? I don't think there are. Thank you, Cathy. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, and now to the final presentation, um, which is again based on some practical experience. Uh, Debbie Gleason uh, is the lead nurse for tissue viability at the St. Helens and Knowsley um, Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust, which is based uh, just north of Liverpool near Prescott. And um, uh, I, it, Debbie actually was the uh, winner of the British Journal of Nursing Pressure Area Care Nurse of the Year, um, awarded to her back in March, I think it was this year. Um, so we're getting a presentation from somebody that uh, has um, a deep knowledge of managing pressure area in patients. Um, and she's going to be talking to you about her five-year experience of using the low-friction parafrictor products 
um, to help her reduce the incidence of uh, pressure ulcers and save money in her trust. So if I can invite you up, Debbie, please. Good morning, everybody. I um, hope you can hear me at the back. I'll have to talk very slowly because I'm scouse and we tend to go 100 miles an hour. Um, so I will, if I go too slow, I do apologise. I've been working in the NHS as a tissue viability nurse now for 19 years. And over them years, we've seen numerous um, practices and protocols implemented in a strive to reduce pressure ulcers. Some years ago, uh, what we did see was following the introduction of uh, profile in bed frames, our incidence of heel pressure ulcers started to meet the incidence of sacral ulcers and in fact in recent years has actually overtook them in our trust despite all the protocols in place, the air mattresses, the repositioning, the skincare regime, etc, etc. And our average age of our patients ranges from 65 to 75. Sir Helens and Nosley is, one, is the third uh, most deprived um, region in the UK. We have a high incidence of cancers, lung disease, um, and patients with lots of comorbidities. So of course, at any one point in our trust, between 60 and 70 patients are actually deemed at risk of pressure ulcers. Why is the heel more at risk? Well, I think the previous speakers have gone into that in some detail. Um, and really, the practices for preventing heel ulcers is relatively a new concept. Previously, we were seeing pressure ulcers from pressure. That is, patients lying in one place for too long. Very little thought was given to the superficial type of friction wounds. Um, and we didn't have a lot of armory or any tools to combat that. Um, so while we seem to have got the gist of reducing true pressure ulcers from pressure through protocols of repetitioning, good skin care, better equipment, profiling beds, lower last mattresses, etc., etc., friction has been really a hidden part of, of, of pressure ulcer uh, prevention, in my opinion. As I say, year on year, we were seeing our heel incidence pressure ulcer increase. And these were pressure ulcers from friction and shear. These were grade two pressure ulcers, mainly blisters. And our protocol at that time, our only protocol we had for protecting heels along with the mattresses and repositioning was to apply a film dressing to provide a barrier between the skin and whatever surface the patient was on. This is not an excellent picture, but it does give you, at the edges, you can see the problem we had. It wasn't effective at all. We were putting the film dressings on, and within hours, it was shearing off. Um, and usually that was because the patient was moving around the bed or digging the heels in. This is a picture taken from a paper written by Jackie Fletcher last year, which is really helpful. And what it demonstrates is, even without nursing intervention, just the patient profile in the bed to sit up drags the heel by 11 centimetres across the surface of the bed. And we felt that that was the causative factors for our grade two pressure ulcers. Up until that point, we'd had an ineffective uh, regime of applying film dressings, which was costly. And it was also the drag effect of the film and the adhesives was caused was not helpful either. So there wasn't really any tool we had to prevent these blisterings other than patient education and appropriate use of the profile in beds. When the Parafrit de Booty came along, we were very interested in trialing this product because I personally felt there was a piece of the jigsaw missing with regards to heel pressure ulcers and friction was the key. So in 2011, we looked at our pressure ulcers and we recorded and separated them out from locality and heels. We looked at the uh, low fabric booty and we introduced the booty into the trust for all at risk patients. And that was a major undertaking. It was a brand new technology. It was another intervention nurses had to think about and they had to look better at their patients. 
The risk assessment tools at the moment, very few look at friction and shear as a risk factor. It's always down to mobility. And as the previous speaker said, if their risk assessment is low, then that's end of. Very little skin assessments are done. The risk assessments are often done at the nurse's station. How do they know whether they're moving around in the bed, whether they're digger in, digging their feet in? So the risk assessment tools I've found in my clinical experience don't help with friction-related blisters on the heels. One of the biggest incidents was in our orthopaedic unit and our biggest uh, incident was in fractured neck of femur patients who typically were using their good foot to push off the bed. So we introduced the booties in 2012 we did provide training at that point. In 2013, we looked at our training issues, and um, if you're not aware, in the UK, tissue viability is, and pressure ulcer prevention is not mandatory for trusts. So we approached our director and nurse and said, if we want to make a significant impact, we need to provide training. So we made training in tissue viability mandatory. So people have to attend one hour session um, once a year. In 2014, we looked at a new risk assessment tool, which specifically identified which patients were suitable for the parafric debuti. It's an 880-bedded uh, hot trust, so we couldn't afford to be, um, you know, issuing these booties willy-nilly to every patient. So we had to have some form of um, identity and risk to demonstrate who are these booties going to be for, who are they going to be most effective in. We looked at the risks and the literature uh, involved and we picked out 11 categories. Most of them categories were identified through Joyce Black's work and we developed a protocol. Any patient with one of the risks was allocated a low fa fabric booty alongside the other preventative protocols, so things like an air mattress, etc. And then the heels were regularly assessed. We monitored the incidence of pressure ulcers monthly and then we broke it down as by location. And then we started to compare it with the baseline, which was 2011 figures. As in most trusts, we do a root cause analysis for all grade two, three, and four pressure ulcers. And we identified that the cost to heal in these pressure ulcers was extortionate, 500, you know, plus thousands of pounds. We looked at the cost of the low fabric booty and what the laundering costs were, because these weren't single patient use, these were multi-use uh, booties. And we looked at the changes in our incidence of hospital acquired pressure ulcers. And this is a graph which demonstrates the changes we've seen locally over the uh, period of the study. So in the top box, you can see our admissions. We're a very busy trust um, with, you know, hundreds of thousands of admissions per year. As I said, the epidemiology and um, the comorbidities involved in these patients is very high uh, for the UK. And this just shows you all our pressure ulcers in the red line. So that is a pressure ulcer anywhere, including the sacrum, etc. And then we've broken it down to just the heels, which is the red line. And what you can see is year on year, we had a significant reduction across all pressure ulcers, but more significantly across the heel pressure ulcers. And this table shows just some cost analysis with regards to how we implemented the low fa fabric paraphric booties, how much did it cost, how much potentially did it save us. We took into a fact and account both the cost of the product, but also the laundry costs. Um, as well. And as you can see, there's significant savings alongside a significant reduction in our heel pressure ulcers. By 2012, we'd reduced our heel blistering uh, with the fabric booties by 32% alongside the training. And after the five years, we had an 84% reduction in grade two uh, blistering events on the heel. What are the implications for that locally and both for the NHS uh, as well? It's now become a standard of care in our trust and in order to meet the avoidability on ability argument in heel pressure ulcers, they had to have had the parafricta booty in place. And my argument is that this is the missing link. When you look in a, um, are, is a pressure ulcer avoidable or unavoidable? How can we say a pressure ulcer was unavoidable when we haven't looked at one of the main causative factors, which is friction and shear? 
just putting someone on a, pre on a mattress and repositioning eliminates some of the risk. But unless we start raising the bar and using strategies to reduce friction and shear, in my um, opinion, we can't argue pressure also was unavoidable. So there is some connotations for that. The staff education and training will have impacted as well, obviously, because they will have learned about the heel, which is not necessarily in all training, and they'll have heard about all the other implications. And it will have been the first time everybody in the trust will have had this training. Unless they've gone to a specific study day or have had an interest in the topic, they may not have had any tissue viability training at all. We had a major focus on heels. So previously, where we were having RCAs around pressure ulcers, we were finding the skin checks were predominantly on the sacrum and the buttocks, and the staff weren't checking the heels. That changed. And we had a focus on friction and shear, not just pressure alone. We had an inspection with CQC in 2016, and they picked up on the practice of trying to eliminate and providing a solution for friction. Um, and we were one of the first tissue viability teams to gain an outstanding practice um, in the comments section for our report. The incidence has reduced and remains below the national average. And our figures are mirrored and uh, the reliability of the data is backed up through the safety thermometer data as well. And it has significant clinical and financial and economic potential within the NHS. This is the protocol uh, that we introduced locally in our trust in 2012. And as you can see, it shows you based on the risk, what uh, mattress to use and what tools to employ. But on the left hand section, it's got them 11 higher risk factors for those patients that have been deemed more at risk for heel pressure ulcers in the literature. And then the picture shows you the beauty and the sizing guide. And these are on all the wards at the Trust. The company are looking at producing a flow chart. Um, there is a lot of products on the market, a lot of variability, and staff do get confused. If they've got a score of this, what do we do? If they're red here, what do we do? So uh, the company, and this is a working document, it's not the final version, are looking at trying to implement a flowchart to educate and advise staff on when to apply the booty and what, where that fits in the whole uh, kit of what practices we use. Another thing that recently uh, we've employed is a mirror. Um, for staff, often patients are unable to roll or turn. It's very difficult to limb very edematous legs and regularly check the heel. So we've looked at in, uh, all the staff now wear um, this tag and it's got a mirror on it. So they're able to, to look and see the patient's pressure areas as well. And the heels are one of them more difficult areas to inspect in some areas. Thanks, Debbie. Um, are any questions for Debbie on this uh, really quite interesting um, implementation with a whole load of practical advice in there as well? I know it's just a question down there. Thanks, Debbie. You could probably gather what I'm going to ask. Are you using the booties in your intensive care unit? Yes. Yes, we do use them in the intensive care unit. Most of our pressure ulcers, I must say, in the intensive care unit um, are due to edema. Um, or due to the anotropes. So the anotropes, a lot of the time, are unavoidable. But the edematous tissues, once we put the paraphrate, to be, it does help in reduce the shearing factors, even in the immobile patients. And you've had the same success in reducing... But the figures we've produced are trust-wide. It's trust-wide. We have uh, two orthopaedic wards. We have a, we're a regional burns and plastics unit. We have a 14-bedded ITU unit. Um, so we have all the specialities. And as I say, uh, the comorbidities and the mean age of our patients is way up there. So that, you know, at any one time, between 60 and 70 patients, 60 and 70% of patients being admitted are at high-risk pressure ulcers. Any other questions? We have one over there. Thank, <clears throat> thank you for your interesting presentation. Um, have you considered the use of this technology in um, pre-hospital transport? 
It, if you consider the effect of acceleration and deceleration on shear of tissues? I only work in an acute trust, so um, we, I don't have any control with regard. You talked about ambulance journeys and transfers and such. Unfortunately, because the product wasn't single patient use, um, it took a lot for hospitals to adopt because they needed to be laundered and reused in order to be cost effective. Um, and we had a big problem getting the community on board. Now that we've got the product on FP10, we're hoping nursing homes, community ner district nurses will be prescribing these products at home. So more patients at home using them, obviously, will be, we'll have less coming in the trust, less pressure ulcers, but also it will affect the whole episode of the journey. But we don't have control, unfortunately, over what happens to our patients before they hit us. It's something to consider. Yeah. Any other questions for Debbie? It seems, Debbie, just on the implementation side of things, you kind of had a, almost a perfect calm, if you like, of recognising the problem of the product being in place, but also the way you implemented it with the education and training of your staff seems to have been a really important aspect to getting this working correctly. Um, yeah, the staff, once they've seen the results, um, bought into it wholeheartedly. Um, and in our trust, um, it made, we made life easier for them. We have an equipment pool, so they ring up for the air mattress, and with the air mattress, they get the care plan, the prevention care plan, and a paraphrate de booty. So they didn't have to look very far. So the easier you make it, the better it will, it will disseminate down. The only problem we did have um, originally was they were throwing the booties away, so we lost a few. Uh, so we slapped a few staff, and that stopped. Um, and, but now they know they can be reused. The other issue which no one's mentioned is the falls issue. Um, a lot of people ask about full socks. We put these over the full socks, uh, sorry, under the full socks. But they've also got a falls prevention pad at the bottom. And in the six years we've been using them, there has not been one incident of a fall related on root cause analysis to the paraphrate de booty. Any last question for Debbie before I summarise? I think not. Thanks, Debbie. Well, I think we've had three really very um, informative and interesting presentations. Um, Amit, of course, told us about the importance of uh, friction and how it creates shear forces in tissue and thereby leading to uh, internal tissue damage by deforming cell structure, the cell skeleton, um, and, and leading pretty quickly in a matter of minutes uh, to, uh, to cell death. Um, and emphasizing the, the vulnerability of heels uh, by showing us the theoretical a patient he had on the bed and what happens when that patient moves um, and, and uh, telling us that friction, low friction materials are likely to be a solution for this. Well, I think the next two presentations help to cement that um, quite uh, strongly. Um, uh, Cathy showed us, um, uh, talked to us about the risk assessment uh, and emphasised the importance of even mobile patients being at risk. Um, but then showed us some really fascinating data that, in a sense, matched what we heard about the subepidermal moisture measurement system, which is measuring a pathological change. Um, and Cathy showed us these data, which showed the accumulation of fluid, which is a marker of inflammatory change and damage happening potentially to the tissue, um, and the impact of using low friction materials on that, uh, which really nicely, I thought, fit the, uh, the theory that uh, Amit presented to us. Um, and Debbie's shown us the impact of using these materials, um, low friction booties from Pyrofrictor in, in her practice, um, where she's implemented the, the booties alongside a, a, a program of education and training of staff to make sure that she can meet um, her um, uh, targets in, uh, in pressure ulcer prevention. Um, it's, um, you may well be aware that NICE, the MTAC Medical Technology Advisory Committee of NICE, uh, was uh, also looked at this technology and they, uh, they issued a guidance on this back in I think 2015 or 14 um, and in that guidance they said um, we believe this technology has some potential but we'd actually like a little bit more uh, research done um, and uh, I can tell you today that uh, a study will be starting um, Keith Harding yesterday mentioned uh, two uh, studies that, have been, uh, that he was involved with that have been uh, promoted by NICE this is one of them um, 
Parafractors products are going to be tested in patients uh, at, uh, through the CEDA organization in, in, uh, in Cardiff. Um, and they're going to be dividing patients into two groups. One will be treated with standard of care alone for prevention of heel pressure ulcers. The second group will be managed with the Parafractor booty added to the standard of care for prevention of heel pressure ulcers. It's a two-week study with sampling over the period of the two weeks. Um, and the assessment of the patients will be conducted blind. Um, so the outcome will be, will be um, measured blind. The outcomes that are going to be measured are the number of pressure ulcers that form over the two-week period, uh, length of hospital stay, the severity of any pressure injury that forms, um, patient acceptability of the booty products, uh, and the cost effectiveness. So um, hopefully at uh, some stage in the future, once that study is complete, uh, that will also be reported to, uh, to this, uh, this conference. Um, so it just remains for me now to, uh, on your behalf, to thank the speakers, Amit, Cathy and Debbie, for a, a really fascinating series of presentations to talk to you about the importance of uh, low friction materials in reducing friction and shear heel pressure ulcers. Thank you.